Anyway, thank you for joining us today. My name is Jim Sutter, and I'm the CEO of the U.S. Soybean Export Council. And my team are excited uh, to be here in San Antonio. We've had a really interesting commodity classic. And even faced with all the challenges that we saw in 2019, we continue to be energized by the enthusiasm and the can-do attitude we've seen throughout this show and the optimism that producers continue to show. I think, it should be, I think it's good that that's there, and I think it can be driven by some simple facts. U.S. soy provides high-quality protein to nourish people and animals in a growing world where that is something that will continue to be demanded, and I believe demanded in growing quantities. It also provides eco-friendly options for an ever-growing range of products, from tires to carpet to asphalt. And U.S. farmers provide soy that is grown with unsurpassed sustainability practices. The world can truly prosper with U.S. soy. The demand and need is there. When we focus on breaking down barriers to access and trade, everyone benefits. Breaking down those barriers and building relationships around the world is what we at USEC and organizations like WISH do. Today, we're going to share updates on our progress in identifying and opening new markets. And we'd like to hear from you, your questions on the market opportunities we see and the suggestions you see for things that you see that we could be working on. I want to start by telling you a little bit more about our organization. USEC was established in 2005 by our founding members, ASA and USB. We're an independent 501c6 organization. And our job is to represent the U.S. soy family in international markets. We talk about being, being there to differentiate, build a preference, and ensure market access for U.S. soy. We do that by conducting outreach and building industry membership within the U.S. across the value chain. The people of USEC have strong relationship with customers of soy around the world, from Asia to Europe to Latin America, and many places in between. Our team members are the boots on the ground who can open doors when issues arise, who work with key commercial decision makers, and who are growing potential and preference for U.S. soy abroad. Inside the U.S., our USEC team members and myself have close relationships with all of our members. And our membership is right now at 99 members, and we're, we, we, we're working on that 100th member, so we're very happy about that. Our efforts must complement the efforts of our members, the work that they're doing, the actual commercial work, because we don't actually sell any U.S. soy. They are the ones that do that, so we need to be working together. I don't need to tell you about the challenges we faced in international markets over the, over the last couple of years. You felt that personally, many of which were largely outside the industry's control. Today, we are seeing positive developments in trade agreements with China, which is certainly good news. But it's equally important we continue to advance efforts to open new markets for U.S. soy. We see opportunities in developed and developing markets around the world. We know that diverse markets will help inoculate U.S. soy from the impact of future trade challenges with any single market, and we're making great progress in building that diversity. I want to show you a quick video that highlights some of the things we've been focused on over the past year. we started talking about an initiative that we wanted to launch called the What It Takes Initiative. So we took all of the other markets in the world that were had either historically been U.S. markets or even a few that hadn't really been U.S. markets and tried to make a projection. Can we, you know, how much could we ship there? How much could we ship there? And that formed the basis of our What It Takes Initiative. So if we hit our targets, we'll have exports about unchanged this year versus what they were last year.
The U.S. Soybean Export Council is the voice of the U.S. farmer for soybeans. It's our great pleasure and opportunity to partner with them in USDA to help them develop those export markets. We implement programs to help assist them and match funding for these promotional and market activities throughout the world. This is a great example of, of some of that money being put to good use to connect buyers and sellers of our products. Well, it really is exciting progress. Let's now take a look at developments in China. Then I'll share some detail on our work in other areas of the world. As you all know, on January 15th, the United States and China signed a Phase 1 trade agreement, which includes U.S. soybeans as part of the food and agricultural products. This agreement includes commitments by China to purchase $40 billion worth of U.S. ag products in each of the next two years. This agreement is a positive step forward for growers and for U.S.-China relations. We were very pleased last week to see an important first step be announced by the Chinese when they announced that companies could apply for tariff waivers to be able to import those products into China. This was something that needed to happen, and it was not clearly outlined in phase one how that was going to work, so we were very pleased to see that that, that took place. Most recently, COVID-19, more commonly known as coronavirus, has had a vast impact on China, which we've all been reading about. This unforeseen and evolving public health emergency has led to questions about whether China will be able to meet the commitments agreed to in the phase one deal with the U.S. I was in China just by sort of dumb luck the day after the phase one agreement was signed. I was there with Stan Bourne, Doug Winter, uh, and, and one of my colleagues from USEC, along with our USEC team. And I think it's safe to say that all of the industry people we had the opportunity to meet with there were very pleased that this phase one agreement had been reached and were looking forward to getting back to doing business with the U.S. So I'm quite optimistic that as the phase one trade deal moves forward, as these waivers are issued, and as we get into the normal time of year when China will be buying U.S. product, we will see them honoring the agreement that they made. For now, the important priority there is for them to be containing the virus, and it seems like they are taking significant steps to be able to try to do that. Our team is closely monitoring ongoing developments surrounding COVID-19 and is assessing potential impacts on market trends and global demand for U.S. ag commodities. It's certainly having so Im some impact, but we have seen no significant disruption in shipments to date. The most important thing to consider are the people currently facing this situation. We have taken steps to safeguard the health of our staff in China and in other places in countries that are affected. And my thoughts are truly with our partners, customers, and the broader population that's impacted. It's our first hope, of course, that this, uh, that this virus is, uh, some, is soon contained. From the perspective of U.S. soy, however, what both of these situations shows us is the continuing need to diversify. Even if the trade situation is fully resolved, we remain vulnerable to different variables, like coronavirus, if we're overly dependent upon a single, mar single market. Our industry will obviously be better positioned for consistent success if we're more diversified. And that's exactly where we're headed. We've been working for years to diversify our international markets. And two years ago, we launched an even more dedicated effort through our international marketing strategy developed together with the United Soybean Board to engage key audiences and to really gather input. Through this plan, we used a market stage spectrum to in help inform where the industry should be most focused, ranging from developing markets, where WISH is focused, and emerging markets, expansion, and mature markets, where USEC is focused. This strategy has a compelling business case that highlights the U.S. opportunity related to future per capita consumption growth. The business case demonstrates that the room to grow in the emerging markets provides the highest return and thus a focus on expansion uh, and growth within those markets is really where we are concentrating these days. Markets like Algeria, Bangladesh, India, Morocco, Nigeria, and several countries in the Americas region 
are the places where we are concentrating those efforts. We also know that all around the world, it takes prioritizing market access, whether it be in developing, emerging expansion, or mature markets. It's mission critical to ensure we retain and maximize the relationships we have, while also ensuring the opportunity and the freedom to operate in those markets. Through a focus on market access, we're able to be both proactive and reactive, or thinking about it in a football term, be able to play defense and offense, to be able to maintain, to meet market needs, to maintain relationships, to manage crises, uh, and to hopefully avoid damage and safeguard opportunities for U.S. soy, while also advocating for future relevant policies and fostering U.S. soy interests in all these markets. With our resources aligned against our biggest opportunities, we focused on building relationships between buyers and growers in key markets around the globe. These relationships are more than just business transactions. Growers, yourselves, U.S. soy growers, know their product better than anyone. And by meeting buyers and learning more about their needs, they're able to show them firsthand why U.S. soy is the best product. It provides an opportunities for buyers to see the innovation, the sustainability, and the quality work that goes into growing U.S. soy. The relationships built go beyond just one-time interaction. They benefit the farmers and U.S. soy in the long term. To offer some additional perspective, I'd like to now invite our chairman, Monty Peterson, to say a few words. Monty? Thanks, Jim. Uh, I'm a soybean farmer from the state of North Dakota and I currently serve as the chairman of USIC. I'm also a director with the American Soybean Association Board. At events in the U.S. and abroad, I spend a, a good portion of my time meeting with international buyers. And uh, during farm visits, I have the opportunity to uh, give buyers a direct look at our product and how it's produced. <coughs> the value of these relationships is immeasurable and something that helps differentiate the U.S. soy advantage for our customers. In face-to-face -face discussions with uh, buyers, we learn directly about their biggest challenges and their concerns, and we're able to work together to solve them and, and uh, help them grow. To me, it's clear that collaboration is the best way to make things happen. That's true whether you're working with your peers on the next farm over or on another continent. It's important to note that we have maintained good communications with Chinese buyers during the recent trade challenges. These strong ongoing relationships will help us to move quickly to resume trade this year and beyond. We've got an important story to tell. Despite facing a difficult economy and a planting season, our farmers' commitment to producing safe and reliable soy has never wavered. It's important that we continue to build relationships with our international customers and to demonstrate that to them firsthand. Let's look at a quick video that highlights a trade mission that took place last year in the Pacific Northwest. This trade mission was put together to respond to a critical trade issue that was impacting the farmers in the upper Northwest due to China not purchasing soybeans. We needed to create new markets for this region. This demonstrates how these trade missions are critical pieces in the supply chain. By having these potential customers visit our farms and see our infrastructure, we can showcase the quality, reliability, and support we bring to the equation. Grow new markets and bring in new customers. Let's take a look.
North Dakota Soybean Council is really excited to partner with USEC on this uh, extraordinary week we have happening here in Fargo, hosting uh, just over 50 delegates from about 10 different countries uh, that are key soybean buyers. Buyers from South Korea, uh, Indonesia, Myanmar, uh, some Asia subcontinent regions, and much of the Southeast Asia region as well. Our group is uh, well-rounded with crushers and feed millers and some poultry production people. They're rapidly growing, so they're looking at ways to get more soy into the region. They're up about 20% in their imports of U.S. soy so far this year, and, uh, and we're looking to, to make that even greater. Right now, we are at the uh, Northern Crop Institute to listen about the benefit of uh, soybeans grown in northern states and then the logistics through the PNW. We will visit some farms and then we will visit uh, shuttle elevators and then we will visit uh, uh, Portland and Seattle area to see how the export facilities are uh, working in that uh, PNW area. Oh, the experience is so great. It's really great working with uh, USEC as a, as a partner to help us bring in these international partners uh, and customers for our farmers here in North Dakota. USEC has their, their overseas offices who are boots on the ground and really connected with those buyers and, and that really helps make that, make that connection here in North Dakota. Being able to meet the people that, that really depend on our product and depend on us as farmers is just makes this full circle for me. It goes back to relationship building and knowing that regardless of the transactions that are involved, at the end of the day it comes down to humans doing business with humans and being able to be friends with, with the folks we do business with. You know, today we have we have the good fortune of hosting another trade team here to the farm, and uh, you know we think that it's extremely important uh, to uh, explain about what we do and how we do it to enlighten our customers on the total supply chain, and that supply chain begins here on the farm. It's so important for us to get to know our customers. You know, I don't just raise crops just to dump them at the elevator. There's people at the other end of that that are going to be consuming that protein. And I think that relationship with the customer is just so important. What we're trying to do today is show them what a typical farm is gonna be. And so we got a whole home cooked meal. With that, we're gonna do the high oleic oil. It's broccoli slaw. You know, I think it's a great opportunity for the buyers to get here. South Dakota is a beautiful, diverse state. And I think when they can get their feet on the ground here and see the, the landscape and how we grow our product, how the, our producers are such stewards of the land. We're trying to build relationships. We're gonna have for the meal coming in, we have local farmers. So the farmers get a chance to see what their checkoff dollars are doing by coming in and meeting the trade team and they're getting to meet the farmers and see and ask them questions. So the guys around here really enjoy it. I think it's important on a lot of levels for, for the local farmers, for us on a, on a state level, to, to get to meet people from other countries and to learn of their cultures and the challenges they face in their business and then to develop relationships with them. I've had the opportunity to travel in Asia and then a few years after that, on my farm, a vehicle comes pulling up through the field and open the door, and here's a guy I'd met in the Philippines. You know, he found me out in the field, didn't even know he was coming. So those type of things are great to, to build a relationship that you can, can follow up with and build on for the future. We have the facilities that are, that are very new within the past few decades where farmers bring uh, the grain in. It's loaded onto unit trains, goes directly to the west coast onto the ships. And so it's fast, it's efficient. Uh, the quality is maintained in the products. Uh, we're just pretty excited that we can be that supplier. This experience is very enlightening because it gives us the assurance the quality, the sustainability, the responsibility of the farmers, not only the farmers plus the cooperatives, plus the logistics side, gives us an overview on the, the different processes in the, in the value chain. And at the end of the day, we, we feel that we need, we, we'd like to have that relationship with the U.S. soy, soy farmers.
visits like these are impactful. Recently, USEC coordinated a trade mission to Bangladesh where participants engaged with soybean buyers, purchasers, and other stakeholders representing the soybean value chain. The trade delegation also had meetings with Ambassador Earl Miller and Tyler Babcock, the Foreign Agricultural Service Ag Attaché. Among other visits, the U.S. Soy Trade Delegation toured the City Crush Organization's processing facility near Dhaka, which was unloading and processing U.S. soybeans originating from the Pacific Northwest while the group toured the facility. CC, uh, CCO employees expressed a strong commitment to U.S. soy, claiming the facility exclusively crushes U.S. soybeans and prefers our quality, which has better protein and oil content for ease of the refining situation. We're confident that this work in investing in the deep relationships we have with our U.S. soy customers positions us to not only recover from the challenges of 2019, but to thrive in the years ahead. Now I'd like to introduce Daryl Cates, a fellow farmer, ASA director, and chairman of World Initiative on Soy and Human Health, or WISH. Daryl. Thank you, Monty. The potential for growth for U.S. soy in the developing markets is exponential. By 2030, Asia will represent 65% of the global middle class. By 2050, one in five consumers globally will be African. And in the next five years, Central America's middle Central America's middle class will grow by 30%. This means a growing group of people in these regions with enhanced diets and with more protein and meat, which creates a huge opportunity for U.S. farmers and importers in these markets to bolster the industry, provide mentorship and technical assistance, and build mutually beneficial and prof profitable relationships. The World Initiative for Soy and Human Health, our WISH, provides trade solutions starting at the ground level and working to shape market dynamics while positioning U.S. soy as a protein partner for the future. We work with key stakeholders to demonstrate the value of U.S. soy for businesses and communities. And as an agriculture development partner, we identify markets that demonstrate growth and then work with these systems to build resilience in trade. This January, WISH visited Cambodia on an exciting trade mission. Cambodia is a market experiencing a great deal of progress and economic development. The country's gross domestic product has increase, is increasing by more than 7% per year since 2011. Growing demand for animal and agriculture sourced protein. As demand grows, we can provide the technical assistance required to build a lasting aquaculture value chain to cr create a sustainable market for U.S. soybeans for the future. Here are some highlights of that trip. It's been a great trade mission here. I think one of the most exciting things was I was here a year ago. In a year's time, just how much development has taken place. It's uh, amazing to see uh, new skyscrapers and the development and growth in the cities, which I think is going to be very exciting for us in the future, for us as soybean farmers, because I see this growth in the cities and that eventually will be a bigger middle class and a better diet with protein, meaning more meat. And that means maybe more soybean meals that they'll use for feeding their chickens and hogs here 
that we can capitalize in the U.S. by shipping soybean meal to them. I want to uh, give a shout out to USDA for helping fund this uh, trade mission for the WISH Committee to come and see this uh, CAST project that we are uh, working with the, uh, the aquaculture farmers here in Cambodia. It is a very exciting program. I was able to go and see a brand new farmer that uh, within uh, the last four or five months has started uh, uh, building his own uh, ponds for aquaculture. He uh, is very excited about this program and asking uh, for uh, the assistance to uh, have him uh, learn uh, how to be a better farmer to produce to the fish and to be able to make a better profit. He's already uh, learned about the uh, AgriMaster feed pellets that uh, float uh, made with soybean uh, meal. They have started a new aquaculture association and I am just uh, thrilled. You can see from the video, it's all about recognizing potential and providing the mentorship and technical assistance that will serve as an incubator for new and growing businesses and building bridges between the key partners of the value chain. Cambodia's aquaculture industry demand for soy protein is projected to reach 100,000 metric tons per year by 2030. This is why in 2019 we launched the commercialization of aquaculture for sustainable trade or the CAS project. It's just funded by the U.S. Department of Agriculture's Food for Progress program. This program will accelerate production of high demand fish species for the Cambodian market and developing a lasting aquaculture industry that recognizes the value of soy protein in feed. CAST will impact all aspects of the aquaculture value chain including 600 commercial fish farmers, input suppliers, and the buyers of farmers fish production. WISH is working closely with key partners including the U.S. Soybean Export Council, the Kansas State University, Auburn University, World Vision, local universities in Cambodia, private sector partners in country, and the Cambodian Ministry of Agriculture, Forestry, and Fisheries to plan for upcoming project <coughs> activities. We're very thankful to our partners and very excited for a bright future across these markets where we are able to demonstrate the U.S. soy advantage through solid support and mentorship, excellent quality, reliability, and sustainability. While in Cambodia, I was able to talk to Mr. Radin Sok, the newly elected chairman of the Cambodia Aquaculture Association. He told me that their goal is to be self-sufficient in fish production in the next 10 to 15 years and they hope to be able to have their so and the next you know and also they were hoping to simulate their association to similar to our United Soybean Board so that they can continue the work on after our CAST project is done. Thank you, and now I'll hand it back to Jim. Great. Thank you, Daryl and Monty. The work that WISH is doing in these developing markets like Cambodia is clearly important, and it sets the stage and builds a foundation for all the rest of the work we do in, in, uh, in later years. It demonstrates how the U.S. brings added value to trading relationships through mentorship, market access, technical assistance, and of course, the reliability, sustainability, and quality of U.S. soy. Now I'd like to talk a little bit more about USEC's work in emerging markets and how that's helping to move the needle for U.S. farmers in these high potential areas of the world. As part of our What It Takes initiative, 
We launched a world tour just over a year ago across priority markets to nurture relationships with our customers there, express our gratitude, and help them to experience today's U.S. soy advantage. As we will at today's session, we're also taking time to facilitate the dialogue with our customers, to hear what they need from the U.S., how we can continue to make our relationship better, and respond to questions that they have. Through our Experience Today's U.S. Soy Advantage Tour, we held meetings in over 20 key markets, as you'll see highlighted there on the screen. We, these were important meetings. We had a grower representative present, we had an exporter representative present, and of course we had some USEC team members, our boots on the ground, and some of our USEC uh, staff from St. Louis there. We said thanks, and we talked to the buyers, we talked to these potential customers about U.S. soy and what was going on in our markets. The investment and focus in the expansion and emerging markets stems from the rapid growth we've seen in a relatively short period of time, especially in markets like Pakistan, which increased by 72 percent, and Egypt, which increased an astonishing 183 percent in just a few short years. We've seen great results across our expansion and emerging markets. The response from importers and others across the value chain has been very positive and these numbers reinforce that our focus is on the right track. We also regularly host potential buyers here in the U.S. to have them experience the U.S. soy value chain firsthand. As you saw in the video Monty shared, in close collaboration with industry partners, we organized five individual teams from Southeast Asia, South Korea, the Asia subcontinent, the Americas, and Taiwan to visit the PNW last summer. On that tour, the delegates saw firsthand one of the biggest advantages of buying U.S. soy, the country's transportation and infrastructure. I was one of the people that happened to be in Bangladesh when we were at that city group crushing plant and saw the PNW soybeans being unloaded and, and actually being processed. And that was the first purchase they had ever made of PNW soybeans, and it came directly as a result of the PNW trip that the buyer had been on last year. So we were very happy to be able to make that connection and see the positive results from that. Last August, over 250 soybean feed and food sector buyers from more than 50 countries convened in Chicago for the U.S. Soy Global Trade Exchange and Specialty Grains Conference to learn about the quality of U.S. soy and how they can purchase U.S. soy. These events provide vital opportunities to connect international purchasers with U.S. exporters and U.S. grower leaders. From a business standpoint, the value of these face-to-face -face interactions cannot be understated. Current and content potential customers appreciate the time that we're willing to invest in their regions, and as we all do, want to put a face and a name with the product they're purchasing. It's a vital part of what differentiates U.S. soy from other countries. You can hear firsthand from importers at the 2019 Global Trade Exchange in Chicago the value that they place on these face-to-face -face opportunities and how it reinforces their perception of the value of the U.S. soy industry. The distinctiveness of U.S. soy is the digestibility of, of its protein the consistency in the quality, um, the availability. So it's easy to plan. It's easy for our buyers to, to, to be well assured of quality. So if we're talking quality products, then US soy is it. What we've seen over time is that on a consistent basis, US soy comes out tops in terms of quality, in terms of consistency in delivery of product. Ten years ago, Egypt was a low protein consumer, um, low protein meal, sorry, consumer. And uh, we were the first plant to start the high pro. And it would be very difficult if we didn't have such meetings with the USEC because they, they support the idea, they support the technology moving forward 
I would say it was a very big success story for, for us and the USEC as well because uh, we needed their help at this time and, and they did a pretty, pretty good job. Like uh, almost all the customer that we got introduced to and uh, even the customer that we were working with, but we changed their mentality and feed formulation to change from a high pro to from a low pro to high pro. It's my first time here. It's been quite nice. Um, met a lot of people, a lot of great people. Um, interacted with them, learned a lot of of things. Um, there's so much hype about production processes in in the United States, and uh, you get to see that there are real people driving these processes, and the processes are still quite natural and not quite as. Um, complicated as it's made to be. So I think it's been a good one. I hope I get invited again. I'd like to come. It's been great. We're looking forward to uh, more work to be done by USEC with us in Alliance in Nigeria and to expand the market really. And we're very confident that uh, the market will expand and US soy is well positioned to mitigate that uh, gap which we have in our, in our country. To keep growing, we know we've got to go to new places. The trade war over the past year has pushed us to move more quickly, but make no mistake, diversification has been a primary focus for the U.S. soy industry for years, and there's substantial cause for optimism as we carve out new opportunities for U.S. soy farmers. You heard Daryl earlier make mention of a growing global middle class. We're also making progress in opening new opportunities in countries like India and Nigeria and helping those populations to recognize the need for protein to drive demand, for which U.S. soy can be the answer. For instance, by 2030, India will move from being an economy led by the bottom of the pyramid to one led by the middle class. Nearly 80% of the households in 2030 are projected to be middle income, up from only 50% today. That's significant. The middle class will drive 75% of consumer spending in 2030, which creates a significant, significant opportunity for demand for soy growth. Protein deficiency is a growing problem in the majority of the emerging, emerging markets identified in our international marketing strategy. For instance, in India, it's estimated that 73% of the population is protein deficient and more than 90% is unaware of the ideal protein requirements. Protein is a highly misunderstood macronutrient in that country, so there's room for improvement there. Over the last year, we've been working with trade, local associations, governments, and other influential groups, including consumer influencers across India. USEC is working to find ways to overcome the problem by educating people about the importance of plant and animal protein as a core part of their daily diets. This is a growing component to drive the overall strategy to engage the value chain in the process while ultimately improving protein deficiency statistics by reducing protein deficiency. Long term, we believe this will translate to increased demand for soy in markets where we know there is a substantial growth opportunity. Through the camp, though the campaign is young, the results have already been strong and will continue to expand. We're using every avenue to reach and educate Indian consumers through a complete and robust campaign that includes web and social media, governmental and consumer influencer partnerships, stakeholder engagement, transitional media, uh, and, and later in 2020, we'll be introducing paid digital advertising. We estimate we've reached more than 170 million people through over 170 media placements in 18 major cities in India. By generating awareness of the critical need for protein that's a part of one's daily diet in a key growth market, we're setting the stage for U.S. soy to be a solution for this rapidly expanding economy. And in a place like India, where we often hear about market access problems, we believe that once the demand is there, and once they realize the need for themselves to be able to feed their population better, these market access barriers will disappear as they then start to import more, more soy to, to, to solve their protein deficiency problem. 
In May of 2019, USEC's first official delegation visited Nigeria. It was exciting to meet with potential customers and partners to discuss how U.S. soy can meet their varied needs, how we can expand our trade relationships, and how we can work with the local value soy chain participants to create demand pull for protein. There are significant opportunities to drive growth in protein, improvements in the overall efficiency and functionality of the food chain, and increases in the utilization of soy within this supply chain in Nigeria. The country's population is expected to reach 264 million people by the year 2030, and it's a very young population. In 2016, Nigerian consumption of soy and soy-related soy products was extremely low, estimated to be only one kilo per person, compared to an average of 55 kilos per person in a normal expansion market. We're also in the process of developing a similar educational campaign as the one happening in India about protein deficiency to launch later this year in Nigeria. The campaign will be focused on making people aware of the value and the need for improved protein consumption. And very soon we'll be bringing representatives from US soy, the US soy industry, state soybean associations and exporters together at our, at our first ever buyers conference in Lagos to meet face to face with Nigerian importers to continue to further solidify and nurture this growing relationship with potential customers throughout the whole of West Africa. It is crucial we position U.S. soy as a way to fill the need in that part of the world. If we can fully bridge this gap in soy consumption, Nigeria and surrounding countries could become one of the U.S. soy's top three growth markets by 2030. One of the unique ways we're working to build demand for U.S. soy is through our Soy Excellence Centers, or SECs. The U.S. soy industry is working to establish these centers in key markets of importance. The first center opened in Cairo, Egypt this past September. Other sites for future SECs include Nigeria, Thailand, and Mexico, or Ecuador. The goal of these centers is to have them become a one-stop shop for industry training. These centers are designed to provide training, resources, and education to all members of the soy value chain in those regions. They will target animal protein integrators, feed millers, animal nutritionists, and local academic resources. They'll allow us to really step up our efforts to do the training that historically we've done through holding seminars in countries and bringing a few people here to the US, but by having a virtual learning center in these countries, connected to a university or some other uh, local training institute, we will be able to step up and increase the number of people that we reach. The centers will also build and facilitate business relationship and links between local and international companies. These centers will not only educate and train, but they'll also build and facilitate relationships with U.S. exporters and U.S. farmers, with the ultimate goal being increasing demand for U.S. soy. So how does all this fit together? As economic conditions improve, as I believe they will, they've been a little, uh, you know, we hear lots of talk about them over the last week or so, but I think we're on a good path and we'll continue to see economic growth throughout the world. And protein demand grows in both developed and emerging markets. There is and will continue to be tremendous need for U.S. soy around the world. We are confident that the work we're putting into building and fostering these relationships will mean U.S. farmers will be able to export more soybeans to countries like this in the future, not only in the Pacific Rim or Europe, but all around the world. By exploring new opportunities, investing in FaceTime, and going the extra mile, we'll continue to identify and create demand for U.S. soy in developing and emerging markets while maintaining our strong long-term relationships in expansion and mature markets. We believe the markets we're investing in will open a world of future opportunities for U.S. soy. But it will take time for these opportunities to fully develop, just as it did dec decades ago in China, where investment started in 1982 and the first sales took place in 1995, so a 13-year time period of working to get the sales ready to start happening. And while we are looking ahead and working on these new markets, we need to make sure that we have uh, a strong future for U.S. soy with China and other current customers. 
open and free trade with China and other large countries is crucial to our industry and American U.S. soy farmers that are prepared to deliver high-quality soy now that we have this phase one trade agreement and other trade agreements in place. Farming has always been tough, and you know that better than I do. But our farmers are resilient. They need access to global markets, though, for their products. 60% of the U.S. soy that is produced gets exported in the form of beans, meal, or oil. So you need these markets to be able to sell your products. This benefits the U.S. economy, provides critical food, feedstuffs, and fiber to the rest of the world. The U.S. soy industry is focused on doing everything we can to bring stability to markets. We know there are livelihoods and multi-generational businesses at stake, and we don't take this responsibility lightly. We'll continue to do what it takes to make a positive difference. This year, USEC is focused on emphasizing strong relationships in new and emerging markets across the globe, and we have several events in key markets on the calendar, and we'll stay fervent in our moves and our mission to identify and build strong relationships with customers worldwide. I want to close by thanking the farmers in the room. Thank you for your life's work on the farm on a daily basis. Thank you for the sustainable way that you farm that allows us to go into international markets and advertise that as a competitive advantage for U.S. soy. Thank you for continuing to support USEC and WISH and the trade missions that we bring here to the U.S. and opening up your farms and participating in our events. Uh, and just thanks for all the support that you provide over the year and have for many years. We would now like to open the floor up for questions and answers. And shortly after that, we'll be taking the opportunity to ra raffle off the uh, gator that we have in the, in the uh, back of the room. So thank you all for being here this morning, and we'd love to hear your thoughts. Any questions you have, we will attempt to answer. Thank you very much. Money, you want to stabilize <laughs> I have no question in my mind uh, that demand continues to grow worldwide. I'm encouraged uh, with what I've seen, what I've experienced. Um, certainly, who could have predicted events like we have currently today? Um, I believe they might have an impact on the immediate situation. But from what I have witnessed, I certainly believe that we are in a world of growing soy protein demand. And I think that that looks tremendously encouraging long term. So we believe in India, as, as I mentioned, that if, if we can get them to... So we've been working in India for... U.S. soy farmers have been investing and in, together with USDA for 20 years in India. Uh, and the goal, the first goal, was kind of a reverse marketing effort to try and get them to consume all the soy they produce. They're the fifth largest producer of soybeans in the world. And we're essentially to that point. They have very little left to export. So they are, they are now consuming all that they produce themselves. And we believe if we can show them and educate them about the need for more protein in their diets, and they have so many people that there's a huge multiplier effect, that that will open up the door for them. They will need to start importing soy protein. And, and we believe that India, 
you know, there are a lot of trade barriers in India. You know, hopefully uh, the idea was that when President Trump was there this past week, that he and President Modi would sign some sort of trade agreement. That didn't happen. And my understanding is that the negotiators from both sides were unable to come to terms on a trade agreement. But they're continuing to work on that. I think India is a tough place, but I think when they need the product, the, ter the trade barriers will come down. So we're focused, our real emphasis today, because we've taught them how to raise, we've, we, we've helped them to be better producers of chicken. That's how they're consuming all the soy that they're, they're, they're growing now. But what we really need to do is get to, to help them to increase their demand by showing them the protein deficiency and by showing the negative impact that's having on their children and by many people in the country. We think that that should raise some awareness and, and we're optimistic that this will do the trick and get them to start really increasing much more protein and then they'll need to start importing. We're hopeful. If anyone else has a question, you feel free to raise your hand. Maybe touch just a little bit on the countries that we've started to export to because India has not been exporting to those countries now. Sure. So as I, I, I mentioned in my uh, comments, both uh, Pakistan has been a real success story lately and, uh, and also Bangladesh. Both of those countries used to receive some soy imports from India. But now as India is consuming all the soy that they produce themselves, they have nothing left to export. So those two neighboring countries have had to turn to the world market. And those two countries both have a strong preference for U.S. soy. Our teams have been doing work in, in, in conjunction with WISH. Uh, they're on the ground in Bangladesh and Pakistan for uh, approximately 10 years and have built up a good reputation for U.S. soy. So both of those strong new consumers uh, have a preference for U.S. soy. So that's, that's an example of its real uh, growth in those countries. The consumers are eating more poultry. They're having uh, more aquaculture in their diet, and that's driving soy demand, especially demand for U.S. soy. Well, Jim, thank you for the presentation this morning. Sure. Uh, as we go into diversified markets, you know, when we're selling to one country, we only have to deal with one kind of government and one set of trade barriers. What kind of help are we getting from D.C. as we go into all the other countries and, and a, you know, a whole diversified various kinds of governments that we're going to have to deal with? Are, are we having other issues emerging that we also need to address as we go forward? Yeah, good question, uh, John Motter. Thank you very much. The question, uh, you know, is about what assistance do we get from uh, U.S. government? We work very closely together as we go into markets, together with the Foreign Agricultural Service, the staff in the country at the, at the local embassy. And I think it truly is a partnership. You know, while we have boots in the ground in the country that know the commercial people, the Foreign Agricultural Service has boots on the ground in the country that knows the governmental people. And oftentimes in these, especially in, in these very uh, young, emerging, developing markets, they're looking to set up food safety systems. They're looking to set up uh, regulatory systems. And if we get there early, we can work together with U.S. government and help to educate them on how to do this and show them ways to make it trade friendly and, and uh, good for themselves while being able to, to, to protect the food safety and the feed safety. So I think we, get, we have very good cooperation. We're also parts of some other uh, trade groups. There's a group called the Food and Agricultural Export Alliance that, uh, that, that U.S. Soy is a part of and was actually one of the founders of. And that organization has the mission of going to these early stage development countries and helping them set up their food safety and feed safety systems. They were very successful in a place like Vietnam, which today has grown to be a nice market. So we, we do that sort of work. And it's it's really important in these early markets, and it helps build confidence in the safety of the product. So thanks. That's a, that's a great point to make. As a soybean farmer, I'm curious as to whether some of these new markets, if you're seeing an increase in demand for non-GMO beans, are they open to both conventional and non-GMO? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, so the question is about non-GM versus or, or conventional soy. 
In India, the uh, preference is for non-GM because that's what they produce. Um, interestingly, they're a very large producer of GM cotton, and they crush all that cotton seed and consume those products. So I think they're not necessarily opposed to it, but I think it's more of a protection for their producers. We believe that once they show more demand, that perhaps that will change. But clearly, there is, uh, in, and in other markets like Egypt, Pakistan, Bangladesh, there they are importing conventional soybeans. There is some discussion around the GM, non-GM question, and some development of their regulatory systems, but that gets back to the previous question. If we can go and U.S. government and these other associations can help to set up their proper regulatory system so they feel a confidence with the products like we consume in this country, we think that's essential. It's uh, clearly there are some uh, other places in the world, other groups around the world that try to come in and give them a different message, but we think that we need to show them the safety of the products that we produce. And lastly, I would just say, um, in markets that have a preference for non-GM, uh, I, I always like to say around the world that the U.S. is a great supplier of choice. We've got farmers that can grow, non-GM, GM, any type of thing a, a person wants, our farmers can produce it, and we've got export supply chain partners that can ship it to buyers around the world. It really becomes a question of economics in many cases and people understanding what it is that they want. So I think we need to be uh, open to letting people make that choice but also talking about the safety of our conventional crops. We shouldn't have them thinking that our conventional crops are not safe. Thanks for that question. One more question. Jim. Uh, oh, sorry. I was going to ask a question. What about Europe? You know, you're not mentioning Europe. You've been a big market for it. Europe continues to be a big market. They're the second largest importer of soy uh, you know, after China. Uh, Europe is a, continues to be a very big market. That's really, I think, the forefront in Europe uh, continues to be a leader in the idea of sustainability. You know, their consumers, uh, like U.S. consumers, I guess, are, are affluent and they're concerned about how their products are produced. They want to know that there is not a deforestation issue. They want to know that there's not child labor involved in the production of their crops. So we continue to think that Europe is a, a market of opportunity for us. If we, as, as they embark on their sustainability journey and take that further and further, we had a USEC board meeting this week. We had a speaker from Holland talking to us about the idea of transparency and how they're moving further down that path. So I think there's, it, it's a significant market that, where there's an opportunity for us, but we need to continue to um, advertise the great work that our U.S. soy farmers do and the great practices that we have here, because oftentimes we meet their requirements. It's just making sure that we're communicating in the same way to be able to do that. Europe is always going to be a place where they talk about non-GM. Uh, you know, I think the perception would be that Europe is a non-GM market. Well, the fact of the matter is, Europe is the largest importer of GM crops, or second largest now after China has become so large. So most of what they import is actually conventional crops. But they make a lot of noise about wanting non-GM, but they, when it comes to it, they buy the GM crops because they see them as safe to feed their livestock. So it's one we continue to work in. We maintain a presence. It's not going to be, we don't think, a large growth market. Uh, they're a pretty you know, flat market. So the growth will come in other more these emerging markets and other expansion markets around the world. Thanks for the question about Europe. Boy, <laughs> drum roll, <laughs> and it is eight six three seven eight zero five. Oh! oh! <laughs>